and closer, and I started screaming louder and louder and louder. And all of a sudden, thank God for Mama. Mama come running out the house. She saw the bulldog. She put on her brakes, <laughs> grabbed David, and took out, and I went right behind him. But as I was running, I said, I didn't expect that dog. You don't ever want to play with your own mind or let any spirit or anyone play with your mind. Amen. You don't ever want to sit there and, and, and get in a bed of self-pity, always harboring and thinking the word, woe is me, nobody just becomes, listen, one day that dog's going to come down your way. Amen. One day those thoughts are going to come back to haunt you. Yes, Lord. And then we're going to really see, you're going to find out that you do love yourself. You're going to find out that you don't want to give up. You're going to find out that you do have hope, but sometimes it's too late. Because you allow the things around you to hinder you. I was in an accident when I first came down here. Bought one of those cars off of old Marlin Avenue. And this car was something else. I know the devil tried to kill me when I came down here. I had eight accidents, and all of them were supernatural. None of them was my fault, trying to send me back. I had been preaching at the Marine base in NAS Atlanta, behind Dobbins Air Force Base. I had a ministry there. And I had been preaching, preacher, for three days and three nights, non-sleep. And I went around just preaching to the officers and to the soldiers, and, and I just preaching. And they got up and said, you still preaching? Preaching at it. Three days and three nights, nonstop. We were living in Lakewood. And I lost my keys. And, and when I finally found them, I took out. And I'm driving up the highway. And I saw this car. It looked strange. I said, Lord, this don't look right. A wagon putting along. I said, this doesn't look right. Maybe some of you, if you ever drove with me, you might hear me say, this doesn't look right. That's why I said it, because it didn't look right. And I went around it. And as soon as I went around the car, my Marlin Avenue wagon went up in smokes. It just went up in smokes. And the next thing I know, something hit me. And I went speeding up the highway, some 65 miles an hour, nothing but smoke. I couldn't see anything. And Somebody say, what did you do? What did you do? I'm glad that. I prayed. I said, Lord, protect my family. Because I don't think they're going to see me again. I can't go to the right. I can't see anything. I said, Lord, just protect my family. I made my repentance of God. I know that the apostle doctrine is right. Just keep me and protect my family. Because there's nothing I can do. And all of a sudden, the wind blew the smoke away. And my car was still speeding. And the Spirit of God put a gap in the traffic. There was a huge gap, and I was able to manage to get onto the side. I got out the car, so what hit me? And when I looked back, I saw another vehicle and an 18-wheeler cab. To show you how hard it hit me, the cab looked like a little bitty toy car. That's how hard I was hit in the distance. And I saw the, the, the cab get behind another car, and then I saw both cars get out the highway. And I said to myself, did somebody hit me? So I got out the car and I ran down there. And there was a woman and her daughter in the car. Kind of beat up a little bit. So I prayed, prayed for them. The Lord healed the bodies. And the guy looked at me and he said, were you in this accident? I said, man, I don't know. I don't know what hit me. He said, well, we need to take him to the hospital. He said, you come too. So I got in the car. We went to the hospital. And the lady was a nice looking, nice looking woman, you know, 30, 35 or so, and had a daughter. I heard the guy call his wife or girlfriend, whatever, and said, baby, uh, there's been an accident. You know, I'm going to be home a little late. There's been an accident. He was hugging all on the woman, telling her, it's going to be all right, darling. It's going to be all right. And hugging all on the woman and taking her into the hospital. And everybody that came into the hospital, the police and everybody, he said it was his fault. It was his fault. New, new to a letter, I didn't have any insurance at the time. I said, Lord, he wasn't even there. And he was hugging all up on her. Then the nurse came in and said, you're the preacher? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, the little girl wants to come in and talk to you. She came in. She said, can you please pray for me again? I said, okay, darling. 
I said, I'm the one in trouble because I didn't have insurance. I didn't hit anybody, but I, you know how the law was. She said, no, we're the one in trouble. This is the fourth accident my mother has had, and my dad's going to be angry. Now, this guy telling everybody, it's, it's his fault. It's his fault. But when the husband got there and he realized she was married, he looked awful stupid when she said, I hit him. She said, but I was driving. She said, and all, and to show you that the devil really tried to get me, she said, all I saw was a cloud of dark smoke. So I decided to go through it. Can you imagine going 65 miles on the highway, not stopping, going through a cloud of smoke and there's a car in there? My car was completely covered and she didn't see nothing but smoke. In other words, in her eyes, smoke just appeared out of nowhere. And she decided to go through it, but I was in the midst. And she hit me hard. And the sergeant came in and said, well, the man looked awful silly. He looked foolish because of his flirtatiousness. Uh, I tried to con uh, convict an innocent person. And the husband came in. He had to back all the way back. That's what the Bible said. When you go somewhere, take a lower seat. Don't exalt yourself. Somebody greater than you may come. And he was mad. And the sergeant took me back to the car. He said, you got insurance, man? I said, no, sir, you know, I, I just come down here. I'm coming from the base, ministering, and I don't have insurance yet. He said, well, it's not your fault. She said it was not your fault. He said, man, just, just go and get insurance as soon as you can. Now, that thing hit me going 65 miles an hour. Just knocked my car off. Do you know I got in the car, son, cranked it up, and drove on home. <laughs> Without a problem. But I saw something. I called mother and I said, Mother, let me teach you something. I said, in any time you go through a situation, don't ever overreact and don't underreact. But try to act accordingly. Man. You see, she overreacted, so to speak, and the man, you women hear me, took advantage of her. Mm -hmm. Hugging her, kissing her on the cheek, all over her. He took advantage of them. So you want to always try to respond accordingly. Don't allow your mind to send you in a frizzy or cause you to become overly emotional when you really know you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Now, my mother was married several times, but praise God, uh, before she left, we baptized her in the name she was through the Holy Ghost so, and she made her peace with God, amen? Mm -hmm. but, but coming up, she was a young mother and raising four boys and it seemed like I was always getting blamed for everything, and I just thought she didn't love me, so I didn't want to hurt my family. I, I went to the streets. Made a reputation for me. It wasn't good, but my family was safe. You understand? You know, I'm from St. Louis. You understand what I'm saying? And so, but I was pole vaulting. And as I was jumping in the air, I had like a four-inch fro. And when I bent the pole back, the wind blew me to the side. And the metal beams that held the crossbar, one of them fell on my head. Now, I had like a six inch fro. I was pretty muscular, pretty strong, straight street. It didn't hurt, but I saw an opportunity to get a hug from mama. So I started to get up and I said, wait a minute. They went and told the coach, LB got hurt. I fell back on the ground. They helped me into the locker room when they all left. I got back up, walked back outside. It was kind of cold. Fell down on the ground. They called my mother. My mother came and got me and took me home and I was still out. Oh, I'll never forget that day. First time, only time. She hugged me and said, it's going to be all right, baby. Oh, I was just I was about 14, 15. I was, oh, God. She said, it's going to be all right, baby. They called the police to rush me to the hospitals. Huh. Like I said, I was straight street. Homeboy looked in there and saw who I was. He said, I can't help him. <laughs> he left me that. He would not take me to that hospital. Probably figured a little rascal needs to be down. Much. Hell, he done called up in this camp. That's all right. So mama took me to the hospital, son, and I was still drugging and dragging. It was an old 
Caucasian doctor. I got down on the table and he looked at me and kind of smiled. He said, he gonna be all right. <laughs> he knew there was nothing wrong with me. I just had a poor ligament. Couldn't walk for a while. Friends came over to check me out. I was cool. I was one of the worst things I could have ever did in my life. Because when I got back on my feet, you understand, son? I could not jump a four-foot high pole. They put it four feet high with a 16-foot pole in my hand. I couldn't jump over it. That was eighth grade. Ninth grade came. I couldn't jump over it. Twelfth grade, and I wasn't even on track. I was in the music. I told my math teacher, listen, you know I'm applying for scholarships for music, yeah? I said, but I got a fear I need to overcome. I got a hurt pole walking years ago. And uh, I need to go out there and try to do it again. I was a senior then. I said, but make sure you keep everybody away from the window. I don't want anybody looking at me. He said, okay, Larry Bryant, you, know, you go ahead and do your thing. I went out there. Four years later, you hear me, son? And I couldn't even jump in the air without a pole being there. I'd run. When you're pole vaulting, you run. You hold your hands like this. You pick up the pace, and then you run. And right where the pole is, there's a hole there. You stick the pole in that hole, you kick your leg up, and you come back and you bend the pole, and your body, your legs are up in the air, and then when you let go, it throws you, caterpillars you up, and as you're up, you turn. There wasn't even a pole there, and I couldn't do it. You don't ever want to hold. You don't ever want your emotions to get the best of you. You see, I have put fear in me when there was no need. And I could not break it. I could not break it because I faked it. You don't want to continue to fake things because it may become a reality. You don't ever want to overreact. You don't ever want to, I keep feeling the virtue. Listen, you know anybody that's always talking negative, talking negative, listen, sometimes you got to give them over to themselves. Because that's the only way they're going to stop it. I don't want to live. I, you know, being in Dixie Hill, every, every, every certain part of the year, we get phone calls, people needing help. And if some of y'all in the mission field, y'all remember what I used to always say? I help anybody what? Once. I done went down there and paid hotel fees only to find out it was maybe somebody and, and, and his trick or something. But I mean, we, we, we paid an extra bill. We've done a lot through Mission Reach. And one day this guy called and uh, I went to help him. He says, I'm apostolic. I'm going to commit suicide. Blah, blah, blah. I went down there and I paid his bill for him. Son, you don't want to do that. You know, you want to you know, you want to live. A year later, the phone call rings. I said, praise the Lord. Tell me, Uncle David. Sir, I'm of the apostle doctor, you know, same faith. He says, you know what, I, I don't feel like living. I said, you don't? He says, no, I, I just want to kill myself. And, you know, I, I, I just can't live anymore. I, I don't know what to do. I, I got to pay my room, this and that. I said, but you know what? He said, what's that? I said, you're not dead yet? He says, what? I said, you're supposed to kill yourself last year. You don't remember me? I said, you're not dead yet? And he hung the phone <laughs> Sometimes you got to let people know, go ahead. Go ahead. Because if you don't take your life serious, how do you expect anybody else? Amen. Now, I'm not talking about people that have real suicidal thoughts. People that are really suicidal don't talk about it like that. No, you know why? Because they'll do it. I've been there. Anybody been there? Mm -hmm. I've been suicidal before. God had to had to deliver me. I know what I'm saying. Y'all remember that lady teacher? Mm -hmm. Mother came down one day to daycare and ran out of gas, needed help, and blah, 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 blah. But that time of year, she came back down. They said, Bishop, that's a lady down here. She's a teacher. She said, she'll run out of gas. Tell her I remember her from last year. She jumped up and ran out. In order to go higher in life, and I'm about ready to close, in order to achieve things and to press 
your way through. Sometimes you have to change your position and rise above Amen. the things that try to hinder you. Sometimes you have to separate yourself from the crowd and reach higher, higher goals, higher frame of thinking will cause you to add to your life. You have to be willing to let things go. Somebody say, what things? what things? I'm glad you asked. The things that are keeping you from pushing forward. Mm -hmm. The things that bring fear upon you. Mm -hmm. The things that will cause you. Sometimes we get caught up in our passions and in our flesh and in our lust and in our desires. And, and they become greater than the need to strengthen our lives. Mm -hmm. Pleasures only last for a little while, y'all. Mm -hmm. Understand that. Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. 